First of all, has the president spoken to you and formally asked you to accept the nomination? Uh, he did, and it was, wow, well, that was the honor of my life um, when he called and asked me to do it. And, you know, you can't say no to the president, but I, I was really so, um, pr I feel very privileged, frankly, to have this opportunity to do it. I, have, I have still will have to go through the Senate to be confirmed, so it's a, a, a long ro road ahead. But um, he, he said, I have full confidence in you, and, and uh, I work with him in the campaign. I, he and I think a lot alike when it comes to economics. And indeed, you're a longtime supporter of the president. As you say, you've got to be put through to be put into the role and accepted. <laughs> do you worry that you might not be deemed independent? So wait, do I, do I believe what? Do you worry that you might not be deemed ind an independent voice on the Fed as you are so closely aligned with the president? Well, no, I mean, I've always had an independent voice. I've got a 30-year track record, 35-year track record on economics. People can, you know, look at my record. And, uh, you know, I consider myself a growth hawk. So I think what I will really try to pursue and, and persuade the chairman of and work with the chairman to try to make sure that the America grows as fast as it can and that wages rise and that we have a, a you know a long period of prosperity through a sound monetary policy like Trump has done a obviously a great job on on tax reduction and uh, you know deregulation and looks like we're gonna get this trade deal done with China if we have a sound monetary policy with stable prices on top of that you know, I really believe we could have three to four percent growth for another five or six years. Uh, speaking of working with the chairman, you suggested a couple of months ago that uh, Chairman Jay Powell be fired and that the rest of the uh, Federal Reserve should be let go uh, for monetary policy incompetence. And you called the Fed the swamp in Washington. <laughs> Are you going to be able to work with these people? You know, uh, that was probably written in a time of anger. And by the way, I think, you know, everyone would now acknowledge that what they did in December with the rate increase was a it was a very substantial mistake, and the Fed has, thank God, you know, reversed that and, and changed directions with respect to the rate increases. Um, so, look, I, no, I think that I, I have never actually met Chairman Powell, but I really look forward to working with him. I know he he wants high growth. He he can be a hero if we get our monetary policy right at the same time we have these very strong um, you know uh, pro growth measures on the you know fiscal side of the equation. So, you know, I. I don't want to be a disruptor. I want to be somebody who can really help uh, Chairman Powell and the others on that board to construct the best uh, pro-growth, stable price system that we can for this country. Well, you're not the only one who's criticized the chairman. The president himself has been very critical. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if he's putting you on the Fed board <clears throat> in order to be a check on Jay Powell, in order to preserve the administration's priorities. The only thing he told me is pursue policies that are good for the American economy and the American worker. You know, he's always said in every conversation I've had, I, you know, I care about wages. I want to make sure that middle class workers are doing better. I care about jobs. He, he didn't really mention anything about, you know, um, you know, differing with, with Chairman Powell one way or the other. What's your view on what the Federal Reserve's mandate is? Because um, the Fed chair had spoken about the overarching goal of sustaining the economic expansion uh, first and then bringing up uh, full employment and managing inflation. What's your view on that and, and do you think it's at odds with what the Fed is pursuing? You know, I, look, I'm for growth. I think I think the potential for the U.S. economy is three and a half to four percent long-term growth, and with the right set of policies, not just on the monetary side, but also on the fiscal and regulatory and budget side, that we could actually do that. Um, so I don't know that I'm. You know, by the way, I'm kind of new to this game, frankly. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be on a steep learning curve myself about how the Fed operates, how the Federal Reserve makes its decisions, and this is a real exciting opportunity for me. So it's hard. For me to say, you know, what my even my role will be there, uh, assuming I get confirmed by the Senate. Let's presume, though, that if you're looking from what the Fed could do right now to hit this three and a half to four percent growth that you think is attainable, what does it need to do? Is it dovish for longer? Do we have no rate hikes for the whole of 2019? Do we even see a rate cut coming before a hike? So, you know, my, I wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal last week um, that basically spelled out a monetary policy that I think 
Donald Trump liked, and I think it might be one of the reasons that he asked me to serve. And what I pointed out, look, I'm not a, I'm for a stable dollar. I think the main, when, you know, in fact, when you were asking me about the dual mandate of the Fed, I think the most important thing that the Fed can do is maintain a, a currency that remains stable and strong over time. And so my fear is that we've seen slight deflation in the economy over the last uh, four or five months. And you see that with the commodity prices that have been falling. You just mentioned the fall in the oil price. But it's not just oil prices. It's, all, it's on, uh, of all the commodities, they've fallen by about 8 to 10 percent over the last four months. That is not inflation. That's deflation. That, so I'm not saying that's not a dovish policy. It's a it's a policy that says let's make sure that, you know, because deflation can be as harmful as, for an economy as inflation has. And so I'm worried more on the deflation side right now than the inflation side. Well, there's no real deflation in the economy by any price measure other than yeah, a few is. commodities. The commodities uh, so, are falling. And, that, but, and the Fed is probably not going to adopt a commodity price target. So how yeah. do you get a stable dollar, particularly if that's not part of the Fed's mandate? You once were an advocate of the gold standard. Are you still? I've never actually been um, a gold standard guy. I'm, I'm open-minded to it. My good friend Steve Forbes uh, has just written a book on, on the gold standard. But I'll, I'll just challenge you on this. I mean, if you don't think we have deflation, then why is it that you know 30 commodity prices have fallen by 8%? I mean, that can really almost all, only be explained by a, a dollar that is too scarce. And my view is, look, Trump has created this incredible pro-growth environment. You have huge global demand for dollars as we become the envy of the world, and everybody wants to invest in the United States. The Fed, in my opinion, in that kind of environment, if they're if they're raising rates, pulling dollars out of the economy, that will that will create a deflation. And I, I don't know, may, maybe you can. You said there's no signs of deflation. How do you how do you account for the big reduction in commodity prices? Well, you look at inflation as uh, or deflation as a broad general move in prices, and we're not seeing a broad general move in prices. As a matter of fact, the Fed's been struggling to get uh, inflation off of uh, the one five to one seven one nine range for quite some time. So it, it seems uh, fairly stable, but uh, beyond that, I'm kind of wondering. Um, by the way, they're a little bit under you, their target. They've been pretty consistently under their, you know, their their target of two percent. So, uh, you know, look, we could argue about you, whether well, they're you, whether they're too tight or too not. I, I don't think that's really well, that's the point the issue here for the markets. Yeah. Is are yeah. they too tight or not? Uh, do you think that they should be cutting interest rates at this point? You know, I'm not sure about that. It's a you know, I have to take a look, closer look at it. And you know, by the way, one of the things I want to do is really talk to the people at the Fed. They've got you know several, uh, you know, you know, dozens and scores of very great economists over there. I want to hear their, you know, the, one of the things that'll be really uh, interesting for me is is to hear the case, look at their data, and then help uh, make the decision about whether whether we are too tight or too loose. I want to talk to you about uh, the debt level. You had said that you are a growth hawk. Uh, there's obviously a lot of uh, fiscal hawks uh, right now in mm -hmm. Washington as well. You're extremely critical when the national debt had reached $18 trillion uh, when President Obama was in office. It's now at $22 trillion. Are we still, in your words, hopelessly over leveraged? And if so, what's the prescription? I've re I look, I've spent my whole career since 19, I think 83, being one of the biggest budget hawks in Washington. I mean, you can go back and look at my record. I've I've recommended you know trillions of dollars of cutting waste and inefficiency out of government. You know, we do have way too much spending. I think almost everyone acknowledges that. Last year we had virtual record levels of of revenues, even with the tax cut. So I don't think it's a revenue problem. I think it is an overspending problem. Um, and so I, I stick to that. I think we need to reform our entitlement programs. I think we need to find ways yeah, I love Donald Trump's idea of cutting every agency by you know five percent next year we got to bring those expenditures down because you know running trillion dollar deficits for as far as I can see is not sustainable uh, Stephen your perspective on how global an outlook the Federal Reserve should have because we've heard recently uh, chair Powell talking more and more about the headwinds faced from Brexit from China how much do you think that the Federal Reserve is a central bank to the world I'm sorry, their role in, I'm not sure I understand the question. How global should the Fed be? Oh, 
Look, you know, what, one of the reasons I think we've seen a fall off in growth, um, you know, the, especially this quarter, has been that the U.S. economy is being weighed down by the global slowdown in growth. So, uh, yeah, absolutely, the, the Fed should be paying very close attention to what's happening globally. You know, we want to see global growth increase because we can't carry the whole world economy on our shoulders. So, you know, in terms of Brexit, um, you know, I, I hope for a good resolution of that where the Brits can can remove themselves from the European Union, but they can still have a free trade arrangement with the Europeans. That would be the best for, I think, both sides of the equation. And boy, it sure looks kind of ugly right now, but I hope there's a good resolution to that. And from your perspective, in terms of the China trade deal, you've been speaking with Trump to a certain extent. Do you know if we're any closer to that and indeed whether China might continue to be such a headwind for the U.S. economy? Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful. Um, you know, I, I spoke to the president a couple weeks ago about this, and he was very optimistic about the chances of getting this deal done. It's tough. I mean, it's tough slogging uh, because the Chinese are very difficult to negotiate with. Uh, I, I've always said that I think Trump is fighting the right fight here, that, you know, we have to, we've, we've been in an abusive trade relationship with China for a number of years now. And I mean, think about the implication if Trump can pull this off and can get this trade deal done where they, they Chinese reduce their tariffs on American goods because they're three times higher than our tariffs, and we can do something about the intellectual property theft that's uh, endemic in, in, uh, in uh, China right now, I think it would be hugely positive for not just the U.S. economy, but China and the rest of the world. So there's a lot hinging on this deal, and I'm feeling more confident than ever that it's going to get done. Uh, we've got to ask you about the balance sheet, since everybody in the markets <laughs> is concerned about that these days. You are an opponent of quantitative easing. Uh, are you an opponent of keeping a balance sheet that's uh, going to be, as the chairman said this week, maybe three and a half trillion dollars? You know, I'm gonna. I, to be honest with you, I'm gonna have to study up on this one and see. You know, I want to. I, I can't wait to listen to, you know, again, what these economists over at the Fed have to say about this and what the chairman has to say. They know much more about it than I do, frankly. So I'm going to reserve judgment on that because I don't have the full knowledge that I need to. to, to you know, but look, over time, obviously, we want to reduce that balance sheet and not have these massive uh, amounts of, uh, of debt on the, on the Fed balance sheet. There's the Fed's balance sheet and then there is the government's balance sheet. Stephen, I want to <laughs> ask a question for you from a Bloomberg customer. Uh, Ten years ago, Republicans obviously very upset about deficits, saying it was unsustainable. The last tax cut um, at the end of 2017 obviously increased the deficits as well. What's your stand? Well, I helped write the tax cut, so I'm obviously, I think it's a tr been a tremendous success. You know, you look at how well the economy has done, it, you know, the, the amazing recovery we've had in this country, the best labor market in 50 years. The, you know, we've got, we had, you know, before the rate increases, we had 4% growth with full employment, with no inflation, the most beautiful picture. So I'm really proud of what we've done with that tax cut. We're seeing nice increases in business investment. Um, it's not an accident that this economy has done so well. It's be it comes in no small part because of the business tax reductions that have made, uh, you know, put more into the hands of the businesses so they can hire more workers, invest more. Um, so I, I think it's fantastic. I think, you know, revenues, I'd like to see revenues coming in at a, at a faster pace. But as I said before, we've got near revenue, uh, uh, near record revenues. We just need to get the spending under control. And, you know, frankly, neither party seems to be too interested in that right now. Although my buddy, uh, Russell Boyd, who put together the president's budget, uh, there's some really good ideas in that budget that would trim the deficit, and I wish that Congress would act on them.